Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In a number of previous videos, I was discussing the really incredible heat waves uh, that have been seen in India and the Middle East and how we're reaching um, this 35 degree Celsius, 100% humidity, or you know, 95 Fahrenheit wet bulb temperatures, at which point you're, you'll sweat like crazy, but the sweat won't evaporate. So you won't have evaporative cooling. So you basically, you know, that's the limit of uh, human uh, endurance in, in that sort of heat. But I'm switching now to the root cause of a lot of these issues that we're seeing with abrupt climate change and extreme weather events, which is basically the, the northern regions, the, the Arctic, and also the, the Antarctic, the polar uh, regions basically in the northern and southern hemispheres. So one of the key questions is these feedbacks in the Arctic and you know how how strong they are, how they're getting stronger all the time and they're pushing us to a world where we have an ice-free Arctic Ocean. And uh, years ago I coined this the Blue Ocean event so you know I'll talk a little bit about how close I think we are to this event, you know, the next four or five years, um, you know, sort of at the outer edge of, of my estimation of when we'll have this first uh, blue ocean event. So the key question comes into play um, then as to, you know, what happens next after that. And clearly there's some very, very powerful feedbacks involving the sea ice and also the snow cover over the land in the Arctic. So it's important to tease out which of these effects is strongest. They're both declining. The Arctic sea ice in, the, in September, which is the month of minimum ice, so that's at the end of the melt season, the loss of September sea ice is running at about 12 to 13% per, per decade for the month of September. Now, the snow cover over the land in the spring um, is falling at an even quicker rate. The area decline is something like 22 or 23% per decade. So that's, you know, the, we, we often talk about sea ice decline as being responsible for Arctic temperature amplification, the, the greatly warming temperatures in the Arctic and people normally say, you know, it's double that of the global average, but it depends on how far north you go. So if you go up to the very, very far north, you know, it's more like uh, four or five times faster warming up in those regions than the global average. And of course, this is key in terms of weather patterns that we experience at lower latitudes because we're getting the jet streams slowing and more meridional heading further north, heading further south, these waves, and these waves are getting stuck. And uh, it turns out that seven nodes around the planet, you know, is, is a configuration that kind of fits with the land-ocean contrast, where the mountain ranges are, et cetera. And we're, we're getting these persistent stuck patterns. And this is causing, for example, or will cause uh, heat waves you know, massive heat wave in Europe uh, next week, for example. So let's go back to the Arctic and look at how strong these uh, feedbacks are. So this arc actually is a Guardian article, the end of the Arctic as we know it. And it gives you a good kind of overview. You can Google it and have a look at this article yourself. It gives you a nice overview of you know, how quickly the Arctic is changing, how you know, it's, you know, we're losing, the most obvious things are that we're losing the sea ice. So this is sea ice, right? This is ice that was formed by the melting of seawater. Um, most of it is first year ice. It can grow up to three, four, five meters thick. Um, it's generally not doing that in most places now. It's a lot thinner. It used to survive, um, you know, melt, melt out summer melts, 
and then it would become multi-year ice and it would reject more and more salt. When, when the ocean, the average salinity of the ocean is about three and a half percent salts. Most of that salt is sodium chloride. So that's dissociated by the water. So you've got the sodium ions, the chlorine ions um, broken apart. Um, so it doesn't exist as, as, as sodium chloride in the seawater, it exists as the ions. When the ice forms, it rejects most of that salt, so we're down to about a percent or so of content. And th those are brine pockets within the ice. So what these scientists are doing is they're, they came in on a ship, um, took a dinghy over to the um, ice flows, and they're scraping away the snow at the top and they're doing coring down to measure the thickness of the ice, the density of the ice or the salt content. They're looking at the biological life. There's tremendous amounts of biological life on these flows. There's algae in, in, inside the pockets. There's a type of jellyfish. There's all kinds of different life. So they're looking at that and the, the algae can change the color of the flow. Meanwhile, in the ship, they're doing measurements through the water column to measure the salinity, to measure the ocean acidification, to measure the chlorophyll content, the turbidity of the water, the temperatures, oxygen contents, all kinds of different things. And basically what they're finding is that as the ice is, you know, as the water temperature is rising, there's less and less ice there's the oceans, uh, the, there's more CO2 being captured in the water. So the ocean, the acidification is going up. There's less oxygen in the water and so on. And this is actually in the Fram Strait um, where, where these flows are. Um, so this is where there's tremendous um, flow of ice out of the Arctic. So these are floating ice flows along wedge, one edge of the Fram Strait. And where are we for the Fram Strait? We're talking about, uh, go down to the image here. So there's Greenland, there's Svalbard. This is the Fram Strait. This is generally where the ice is formed. And so what they're seeing is they're seeing these ice flows coming out here. These are the warm currents coming up from the, um, the Gulf Stream, coming up and crossing the ocean and coming up here. So these are warm water, which is, which is going underneath the ice. And of course, instead of a lens of fresh water that we would normally get when there's lots of ice and ice melting, there's less and less ice. There's more and more wave action. There's more and more mixing with the warmer, salty water from below. And that heat is, is contributing to the ice melt. 80% of the water exchanged between the Arctic ice Cap, so the Arctic region and the world's oceans passes through the Fram Strait. Okay, so this is a huge um, transportation uh, means that's connecting the world oceans to the Arctic Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean is rapidly changing. We're, we're losing the sea ice, we're losing snow cover in the land around the Arctic, and this stuff. These are tremendous feedbacks. These are causing Arctic temperature amplification. So actually, so how much of that is occurring? I'll, I'll talk about a study where that's going on. I just wanted to point out that, you know, one of the scientists is saying there will still be sea ice during the winter, but in the summer it will probably disappear. Okay, um, now it's amazing to me that this is still the, the view of, of uh, mainstream science that there will still be sea ice during the winter. Um, I don't believe that for one minute. I don't see how the sea ice can persist during the winter when it goes in the summer with the first blue ocean event, you know, say a September in the next four or five years, within a year or two of that, it'll be gone for August, September, October, within another couple of years, you know, add July and, uh, November, so, so July, August, September, October, November, and then within less than a decade, every month of the year. I, I think we're heading to a planet with no sea ice. But still, if you talk to most of the so-called experts, they say that there will still be sea ice during the winter. I think, I think they're, they're uh, incorrect. I think they're all, they're all dreaming. They're all hoping. 
but um, I don't think the data uh, supports that. Okay, so of course, if you want to look at the Arctic uh, sea ice, you know, real time data, uh, just Google Arctic sea ice graphs. You get this great website. You can see images from the previous day. You can see all kinds of plots of what the Arctic sea ice is doing, and it's been very, very warm. The ice is very, very thin. It's rapidly decreasing. It's been record lows for the longest time. Um, this is a previous record low in 2012, the dashed line, so we just went above that. You know, there is fluctuation. You know, it's like a, it's like a horse race. Lots of people are watching it. Um, some cheering for it to disappear and get it over with, have the first blue ocean event, and others saying, well, you know, let's, let's delay that as long as possible, cheering against it. Now, of course, so, so people are overly focused on the sea ice and less so on the snow cover. So let's have a look at the, if we go to the Rutgers University Snow Lab, the Global Snow Lab, you can just Google it and have a look. Um, and I'm looking at the graphs here. Um, and this is the anomaly um, anomalies from 1967 to present day for January. Um, and what you can see is there's a lot of fluctuation, but you can see generally in the last number of years, there's been more snow cover um, than previous years. You know, there's been generally, these are gener there's been more snow cover than, than previous years for the month of January. Now let's just go through the month. So now we're looking at February, a little bit more here, um, more snow cover than the, than the norm, the average over that time period. That's February, that's March. Now there's more of a variation, um, you know, some years more, some years less. And then we go to April and there's more, generally the trend is that there's less snow cover in April. Okay, but there's still some years with more. Now we go to May. Now May, you start getting, so in April, there was less. In May, you know, most years have quite a bit less snow cover, this is in millions of square kilometers, this is the year, um, then the, so the anomaly is negative, and then we can go to um, June, and it's significantly lower here, most years are significantly lower, um, negative anomalies, we go to July, still negative anomalies, but they're getting smaller, and then August, still negative anomalies, but quite small, and then in September, we start getting more snow cover um, in recent years. October, more. November, more. And December, it's more mixed. Okay, so basically what's happening is, is there seems to be a bit more snow cover, snow cover anomalies in the fall, uh, moving into the winter. But then when you go into the spring, Okay, there's large negative anomalies. So we'll go back to April, to May, to June. So June, you know, is the most significant here. Huge negative anomalies of, of snow cover in the, you know, on the land in the Arctic regions. This is making the region much, much darker in the spring and it's setting up for the, the summer melt. Okay, so this is a great website. So. Now I'm going to go and discuss uh, a recent peer-reviewed paper that came out at the beginning of, it was published online early January of this year, and it estimates the contributions of the sea ice and land snow to, uh, you know, to the, the, the contributions to the, to the overall system, the feedback system, uh, the climate feedback. Okay, so it uses NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, the CESM, Community Earth System Model, to try to tease out the contribution of sea ice and land snow to climate sensitivity, to global climate sensitivity. Um, so basically what they do is they model the increase of atmospheric CO2. And what they do is they, they look at the scenarios where there is the scenario that we have with sea ice and, and snow cover. Um, and then they take away the sea ice and look at the change, take away the snow cover, look at the change, take away both and look at the change. So I'll discuss this in the next video. Thanks.